read by Dale Grothman. An Unusual Ghost Story The Cat of Chiltern Castle by Mary Sharon When Jean Winthrop invited me to come up during the hunting season and try for an elk, I accepted with alacrity. I had not seen my strapping cousin since his return from overseas, and I anticipated a pleasant visit. Having been left a small fortune by a bachelor uncle, he had traveled extensively before enlisting in the World War. I had spent many pleasant hours in his company listening to him recount, in his inimitable manner, the many and strange adventures that had befallen him. Jean's cabin stood a half mile above the stage line road on Wind River Point in the Teton Range. The stage driver dumped me and my belongings unceremoniously by the roadside and disappeared in a flurry of snow. I watched hopefully for a sight of Jean's strapping figure, expecting any minute to see him come around the bend in the trail. Dusk deepened with the startling suddenness, and I decided to try to find my way alone. I could not understand what had kept him from meeting me. I wondered if my letter had miscarried. I have always prided myself on having my full share of feminine courage, but as I stumbled along the trail I felt distinctly nervous. The distant yowl of a wildcat sent a shiver of apprehension down my spine, and as I scrambled up the rocky path I fancied I heard the soft pad-pad of stealthy feet following me. Chiding myself for a tenderfoot, I unlocked my case and took out my gun. As I drew it out, I caught sight of something moving in the brush to my left. I tried to convince myself that it was the night wind moving the branches, but I knew it for something more sinister. I saw it moving toward me, a dark blot among the foliage of the underbrush. Without hesitating, I fired. When I looked again, it was no longer there. Before I had time to investigate, a shot sounded below me, and then a flashlight glimmered down the trail. I hallowed. Jean answered. When he reached me, he was out of breath and strangely shaken. What was it? I asked without preface. A cat. He shrugged his shoulders with elaborate carelessness. When we entered the cabin, I saw that his hair was matted with blood above his left temple. At my exclamation, he reassured me. It was nothing. A dry branch gave me a scratch, nothing more. I was astounded by the change in his physical appearance. He was stoop-shouldered and gaunt. His hair was streaked with gray, and he had an air of fearful alertness, as if waiting momentarily for some grim, unavoidable happening. More evidence of the change that had come over him lay in the neglected and run-down state of his cabin. On all of my previous visits I had noticed the clean, almost womanly tidiness that had prevailed. To judge from the appearance of the place, he had not attempted to clean it in the three months that had elapsed since his return from overseas. He made an effort to appear at ease, and cooked an appetizing supper for us, but I noticed that at the end of the meal his own food lay virtually untouched before him. After supper he walked into the living room, threw more logs upon the fire, and motioned for me to be seated. Our talk was dulcetory, almost formal. It was a beastly night outside. The wind howled around the corner of the cabin like so many lost souls, and the insistent tap-tap of the icy branches against the window panes did not lessen the effect. Winthrop sat staring moodily into the fire, and I noted the ravages that the years had made in his physique. I wanted to ask him what had caused the terrible change in him, but a certain reticence forbade prying. 
I felt that if there were anything that I could do for him, he would ask it of me. For we had been reared together as children and were as close as most brothers and sisters. A particularly heavy blast of wind assailed the cabin, and a shower of sparks flew up the chimney from the pitched logs, which were roaring on the hearth. Winthrop shuddered involuntarily. I sought to arouse him. Doesn't this place get on your nerves, Jean, so far from everyone and everything? He started at my question, and then drew savagely at his pipe. Suddenly he sat up and held his head, cocked in an attitude of listening. Abject terror shone from his bulging eyes. Do you hear it? he demanded. Nothing but the storm, I told him truthfully. What is on your mind, old fellow? Anything that telling might help you to forget? He pondered a moment. There was a hopeless, negative intonation in his voice when he answered. I don't believe anyone could help me, Mary. It is something just a trifle beyond the province of mere man. Do you believe in ghosts? Something had prepared me for his question. I had known intuitively that he was a dread of the supernatural, for nothing on earth could have brought that look of awful fear to the face of the Eugene Winthrop I had known. I hardly knew how to answer him. I can't say that I do, Jean. We are all doubting Thomases about everything, until we see it for ourselves. He turned toward me with an air of positive assurance and his voice was quietly assertive. I have seen, and I believe, Mary. I am afraid you will think me insane. Perhaps I am. But I am going to tell you all about it. And then he began his weird story that left me shaken more than I care even now to admit. When I was in France, I fell in with an Englishman, who had enlisted under the name of Tom Grant, though he gave me to understand that this was an alias. He was a damn good fellow, foolhardy, reckless, and pleasure-loving, with a nerve that would have faced down the devil himself. When everything was over, we went to London together, and it was there that he learned, from a second-rate solicitor, that he had fallen heir to a debt-ridden old ruin, the castle of Chiltern. I shared his desire to see what remained of the once stately fortress that had sheltered his famous ancestors. For the line of Chiltern had written its name in the early pages of English history. We went. Before our departure, the old solicitor told us that a family ghost went with the castle, a cat. We both laughed in his face to think that a house which had once held such prestige and power should elect to claim as its especial ghostly visitation a cat. Tradition had it that several hundred years ago a serving woman had imparted information to the enemies of the then incumbent Lord of Chiltern, who in retaliation had shut her up in his dungeon, where the wretched woman starved to death. The cat, a huge black fellow, had been her pet, and its shade was supposed to be vested with the power of seven devils. The story was improbable enough to make anyone scoff at it, just as we did. We found the castle a ramshackle affair, though it took no great imagination to picture the grandeur it had once possessed. The grounds were enclosed by a high wall of crumbling masonry, around which at one time had been a moat. Both were now in the last stages of disintegration. The castle itself was barely habitable. The caretaker, a very old hag, volunteered to show us through the fortress, and we accepted her services, though they were somewhat surly given. We found the entire structure in a sad state of decay. The night of our arrival was a stormy one, 
the wind howled fiendishly around the old walls until they shook from the turret to the foundation stone we expected the old ruin to topple over at any moment it had drizzled through the early evening and as it grew colder settled into snow the room in which we spent the night was barely furnished in one corner projecting out into the corner of the room stood a huge canopied bed the frayed and rotting silk hangings at the top attested to its great age a peculiar cabinet of old walnut stood in the far end of the room near the one large window which uncurtained looked down upon the bleak and rock-strewn courtyard two high back chairs of nondescript age and appearance completed the furnishings of the room with the exception of an old venetian mirror the one article of value and elegance left to the castle of the chilterns we went to bed but did not sleep there was something eerie about the decaying old fortress that made us wakeful we left the candle burning in the old pewter stick which the crone had given us before returning to her home it must have been two o'clock when we heard it during a lull in the storm a terrifying shriek rent the air tom leapt out of bed on one side and i on the other as our feet struck the floor a series of blood-curdling yowls much too loud for a domestic cat but somewhat similar in other respects sounded outside our door we hurried into our clothes when the yowling ceased we heard a light scratching on the door insistent steady as the beating of a heart the scratching continued increasing in volume until it sounded almost like a human hand knocking imperatively on the panels which threatened any moment to give way given the same occurrence under different conditions our reaction would probably have been different but with the wind and storm assailing the old ruins from without and an unknown animal or supernatural something assailing us from within we felt anything but brave I acknowledge that I was paralyzed with fear a fellow can grapple with and perhaps overcome a mortal enemy but the supernatural cannot be vanquished by mere man and that unearthly yowling and scratching resembled nothing I had ever heard with an oath Tom seized one of the chairs and motioned me to do likewise I lost no time for the moth-eaten door afforded flimsy protection the steady hammering and slashing continued interspersed with shrieks and yowls suddenly one of the panels splintered in a heavy gust of wind extinguished the light and the room was left in total darkness another blow and the entire door fell inward two green eyes glowed at us from the doorway Tom screamed a warning as the eyes, like dancing lantern lights, swayed toward us. I lifted my chair to strike, but on the instant that I stood poised in readiness, the eyes were blotted from sight, and in an instant Tom gave an agonized shriek. A heavy thump followed, and all was still. I called fearfully to him, and the old walls threw back my cry. I struck a match sprawled on the floor lay Tom's body I hurriedly lit the candle and knelt to examine him he was completely covered with knife-like cuts and scratches and the blood was trickling from a hundred wounds while I was kneeling over his body cursing myself that I had failed him when a blow might have saved his life that horrible yowling began again becoming fainter and fainter until it blended with the din of the storm I can never forget I always hear it I hear it now his face was a study of tragic despair I could think of nothing to say to relieve the tenseness of the situation he straightened in his chair and listened don't you hear it Mary tell me the truth 
Can't you hear that yowling, faint and far off, but coming nearer? I listened, and I could hear it. The sound could be plainly distinguished above the din of the storm, faint, but growing louder as it approached the cabin. I hated to acknowledge to Jean that I could hear it, but I knew that if I did not, he would think he was suffering from some sort of hallucination. There came a lull in the storm, and a scream like nothing I have ever heard before or since sounded just outside the door. With white face and staring eyes, Jean sprang to his feet and turned toward me, threw out his hands in a helpless gesture. It's no use, Mary. This is the third time. I may as well face it and have it over with. He walked to the door and slid back the bolt. Before he could open it, I jerked him back. Don't go out there, Jean. This is a panther. Let me get a gun for I turned to pick up my Winchester, wheeling in time to see him open the door and stagger out into the night. I leapt after him, too late. A shriek shrilled through the storm. I ran toward the spot whence it came. The wind blew open the door behind me, and the glare of the cabin lamp threw a bar of light across the new-fallen snow. I could see, standing over the prostrate form, a big Jim Winthrop, a huge cat, the size of a collie dog, pitch black, with green wolfish eyes. I raised my gun and fired. I was so close that a miss was impossible. I fired twice. The bullets took no effect. The beast, without moving, melted into the shadows behind it. I tried to hunt it down. But how could one follow an evanescent thing of evil that departed, leaving no tracks behind it? I dragged Jean's inert body inside. He was cut to ribbons. The thing sounds incredible, but it is true. The coroner's jury turned in a verdict that the deceased was killed by a panther. But I know they were wrong. I saw the beast that killed Jean Winthrop. It was a huge black cat with wolfish eyes. The cat of Chiltern Castle. The end of The Cat of Chiltern Castle by Mary Sharon.